Hey everybody, happy Friday, it's Greg Rand, welcome to This Week in SFR, or the SFR Show. Um, we used to call it Touch Base Fridays because um, as those of you who have been here, thank you by the way, a lot of you I recognize names that have been here uh, many times um, and come pretty consistently. Uh, we catch you on Friday afternoons because you're not going to catch me in a better mood than I am on a Friday and I'm hoping to catch you in the same kind of mood and share with you what we see happening in the SFR sector this week because it's happening you know a lot's happening and it's happening pretty quickly so we actually toy with the idea of having this thing be not every week because there are days that I don't feel like doing it um, never once we start I'm always into it once we start but sometimes a couple of hours prior I'm like what am I gonna say um, what do I have to talk about but this week is not like that because there's a couple of pretty cool things one of which is a a new relationship that Own America has been forming over the last I guess month or two um, with an investor in a new market uh, that we haven't profiled here before. I'm going to introduce uh, David and Mike in a couple of moments. Um, and so let me just start it by reminding everybody what we do here. We've fallen into a pretty good groove where we're focused on the, um, the strategy and tactics of SFR and promoting this notion that you know, people like to talk about the stock market and other things as being strategic in nature, you know, like what you know and how you use your own ingenuity and, and, uh, and your own personal genius. How can, you, uh, how can you make money with that? How can you be smarter than the average bear? How can you learn more? How can you really specialize and figure stuff out that other people haven't figured out and then be enriched by it uh, in your own business success and financial success? And SFR is an awesome marketplace precisely because every – market in the country is different, different fundamentals, uh, which is that's the strategic side of this. And then there's a tactical side, which is once you choose a market, how do you, you know, how do you apply the blocking and tackling of selecting sub markets down to the neighborhood level to selecting sources of properties to buy and and what kind of data do you use to make analyses that are going to give you an edge. Um, and I love I love real estate entrepreneurs. Um, I love having them on the show and I love having you here to, to hear them speak because you're, you you can't help but realize um, how much common sense and intelligence you can bring to this. You got to have both. Actually, all you have to really have is common sense. <laughs> you, can be, you can have a ton of common sense and not be able to, to uh, pass the SATs and do great in real estate because it is such a common sense asset class. But when you bring an intellect and intelligence and analysis to it, it even goes – uh, you take your instincts and apply um, whatever you can. So we're here to try to inspire people to get more into this. Whatever your role is in the SFR business, we've got people on here that I know are underwriters who work for investment funds, who are straight out of the MBA class graduation and right into the, the real estate business. And so they're, they're sort of learning the way the street operates in this space. We've got people who are on the street operating. We've got real estate brokers, lawyers, title companies, lenders, all kinds of folks um, that are, all have one thing in common is they've chosen to ride this wave and a big wave it is. So um, today we're going to be talking about a market that's kind of near and dear to my heart, uh, which is Pittsburgh and, um, and an investor that we've met, Mike, uh, I'm David, I'm going to unmute you now. You probably get called Mike all the time because you got two first names and so people are always, are always, uh, David, can you hear me? I can. Thank you. All right, cool. Yeah, sorry to call you Mike, but I'm guessing that happens every day. Uh, you know, every every now and then, every yeah. now and then. Yeah. I, I get called Rand all the time, and that's like there's only one guy I know whose first name is Rand, and he's a senator. Um, right. Yeah. So anyway, hey, uh, welcome, David. David, Mike, um, give me do me a favor, so everybody knows who you are. Just give us a, uh, you know, give me a thirty second bio on what you do and what got you here. Sure. Uh, thank you for that intro. Um, my name is David Mike. Uh, I originally uh, am from Pittsburgh. Um, I left Pittsburgh and, uh, you know, after I went to college, I worked on Wall Street for a while, the majority of that time at Goldman Sachs in interest rate and credit derivatives, um, of all things. Uh, did a short stint at Deutsche Bank where I ran um, a variety of sales groups. Uh, then I started working for uh, a number of hedge funds in the risk management role. Probably around 2009, uh, 2010, I noticed some substantial changes in the Pittsburgh market and a lot of uh, momentum 
And coincidentally, during the crisis, one thing that you didn't see in Pittsburgh is you didn't see prices go down. Um, they only went down 2%. So historically, post the steel mill crisis, uh, it has been a um, you know very sideways market that's really gone nowhere for 40 years. And there were a number of large catalysts occurring, which I'll talk to you later, um, that we thought was interesting. So we began, um, a number of people that I worked with on Wall Street have funds or, uh, you know, worked for larger companies that were buying single family homes, fixing them up and renting them out. And I was comparing the sort of gross rental yields that we were getting to what they were doing, and it was significantly better. Uh, and because of all the catalysts and changes that I saw in real upside momentum for the first time in 30 some years, uh, in the Pittsburgh market, I started to become excited because I thought you have a low volatility, high income, uh, market that has now an upside catalyst. So for the past several years, I've been going, uh, we started a number of funds. We've been investing. Um, we've also done side projects in, uh, non-residential, um, projects as well. But, you know, we've learned the trade over the last, uh, four or five years. Um, we were able, because we were local operators, uh, you know, to your point, it is critical is the thing that we learned. Uh, because we are from there, um, we being my operating team as well, we were able to build out our vendor network pretty quickly. Um, so all of our plumbers, mechanics, HVAC people, uh, we were able to cobble together a, a good team in, in a short period of time and people that you had long-term relationships with 20, 30 years of, you know, going to high school with them and everything else. Yeah, I was going to uh, guess some of your high school buddies are probably on the team there. Let me touch on a couple yeah. of things. Great, great opening, and that what you've done here is you've done the same order. This is how we learn that it's strategy, then tactics, geography, and then blocking and tackling. You mentioned that. I, David, can you see what's on the screen? Are you in a place with a computer? Um, I'm, I'm not, but I'm, I'm in a conference room. No worries. No, no, I can I, I can walk out. I'll have to describe it because this is this is a radio show with visuals, but we don't need the visuals. So, um, <laughs> we talked about the home price performance, and this part that I'm showing right now goes back to 1997, and it shows the median sale price um, each year from then till 2017, or mid-year 2017. And what you see on the chart is you see a blue line, which shows the United States, okay, with a very, very steep curve upward right to about the chart. So it's a 20 year chart, and right smack in the middle is a peak, and then it goes nose diving back again, kind of lands in 2013 at the bottom, and then starts to creep back again. And what you see, which is kind of cool, is the market deviated from its trend line to the high side, corrected pretty hard to get back, and ended up a little below the trend line, and then kind of crept its way back right to where it seems like it wanted to be all along. Like the market objected to the way us human beings were manipulating it, and so it just chewed us all up, mauled us, and then went back to its its lazy um, hibernation again, which is a nice steady increase. So the U.S., when you take those highs and lows and blend them out, had a national average of 2.94% median sale price increase per year over the last 20 years. Then you see a black line on the chart, which shows the state of Pennsylvania, which has a little bit a much more easy nowhere near the kind of peak and nowhere near the kind of correction, but still the same trajectory and ended up where it wanted to be. And the roller coaster was much milder and it ended up with a 2.84. So 2.94 national average, 2.84 state average. And then you have Allegheny County, which is the majority of, you know, the, the big center of, uh, of Pittsburgh. <clears throat> and it is a straight line. You think that I did, I think I make this up, right? There's like, you see in 2008, 2009, this tiniest little blip sideways and then back to the trend line. But then towards the end of the trend line, 2014 to 15, then to 16 and to 17, it actually takes a steeper upward trajectory. Not one that would make anybody re be worried about a bubble, but one that just shows kind of what you were talking about. So that during all this madness, you and your friends, and your customers would be watching CNBC and hearing about a housing meltdown, but it wasn't happening there, was it? It was not. And, uh, you know, that, that's what I thought was unique was everyone was running around looking for distressed assets, and people still do that. 
uh, and so no one ended up at, in Pittsburgh because nothing went down. But it's been, you know, it hadn't been going up for 40 years. So I, you know, I don't, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know how you define distress. But, but yeah, we thought we were buying in at attractive levels, even yeah. given the large corrections in the hotter market. Yep, and you know what has when you when you when you have the the benefit of hindsight now, when you blend the entire thing out, national average two point nine four, state average two point eight four, county average three point four nine. So volatility might have presented an opportunity to some people, but if your business model was based upon just putting as many boats in a rising tide as you could, this tide has been rising as it turns out now faster than the markets that were more volatile which I think is awesome because it goes back to Pittsburgh was not about volatility. It was about stability and a market that had been flat for too long because of some things that were very tangible, right? The Let's talk about that a little bit. So you had, they call it the Rust Belt, right? Um, factories, right. manufacturing, exited. Uh -huh. um, just give us a quick thumbnail of kind of when that happened. Like it was a it was a 75 year run and then all of a sudden it came to a pretty harsh halt and then what's happened since then to replace it? Sure. Uh, if you look at statistics during the Industrial Revolution, you had enormous population growth. Um, you know, one of the counties that we're operating in, believe it or not, was the third richest county in the country. Uh, the tremendous wealth. People don't realize Pittsburgh was New York before New York. Um, it was the Carnegie's, the Mellons, the Rockefellers, you know, on down the line. Uh, as the steel mills started to decline, the Industrial Revolution ended, the wars ended, um, and then getting into the 70s and 80s, um, when a lot of the steel mills started to um, falter, uh, and then eventually go bankrupt and eventually shutter over the next 10 or 15 years, um, what happened is you have sites that are have great value. Um, the entire transportation system of the United States was built to service these sites, not the other way around. Um, because, it, again, in wartime, it was all about making as much steel as you could and shipping it to wherever you needed to do to make planes or bombs or, or what have you. So you have great infrastructure that's already there that would probably cost hundreds of millions to replicate. You have railway access, um, uh, uh, car access uh, to interstate highway access, and you have um, uh, uh, rail and you have uh, shipping on the river. So uh, that was the backdrop. What happened subsequently in uh, Pittsburgh proper, it became the epicenter for artificial intelligence with an autonomous car driving all surrounded by Carnegie Mellon's robotics lab. So Google, Uber, Ford, or all, all have their autonomous driving headquarters there. Um, Google has a partnership with the Carnegie Mellon Lab on a number of AI projects. Out where we are, where closer to the airport area, um, where along the Ohio River Valley, all of these sites that I mentioned, all these old abandoned steel mill sites over the last 20 years were purchased um, largely by individuals and they were remediated all the metallics and all of the bad stuff from making steel for all those years. And what you saw was a resurgence in that area around oil and gas drilling related to the Marcellus Shell, the Utica, and the Upper Devonian. And really the second wave of that is now happening where large petrochemical companies are now coming onto these sites led by Shell Chemical, building a $7 billion ethane cracker plant, which could produce up to, you know, 10% of the United States polyethylene. So, what, so this, what does that, that all mean? Yeah. Let me jump in for one second. So the 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 shell um, was this is this all going on in the last five years, or is it ten years, or is it even more recent than that? We that's what really that was the catalyst that got us excited and got us in the game. Um, that was starting in about 2000. 10 is when the discussions were. It took five plus years for all of the permitting, the approvals, the research, the due diligence by Shell to figure out if this was a viable place to put a, you know, gas, enormous gas processing facility to make plastics and polymers and resins and everything. Um, ultimately, they came back and said yes. Uh, and what's interesting is within the 200 
uh, within a, uh, I'm sorry, there's 700 comp, uh, shell subsidiaries that could time this plant that are within, you know, hundreds of miles of this plant. Uh, so that made it more palpable to them and the location to the East Coast and to Detroit, um, where they could ultimately ship their products, they can really lower their transportation costs. That answer your question. Yeah, it does. It's, so it's, it's really like one of the things that I have on the chart here um, on the screen now is population change. And I love talking to a person like you who can tell you kind of qualitatively what's happened over time and then see if we can look at a, look at the data visualization and see if we can make it all make sense. And so like we, we, just, we just had on the chart the, this long, you know, very flat market of price appreciation. And then it's sort of in the last four years, a couple more degrees of steepness. And that indicates that since they started announcing these things and getting approval for them, it's been attracting population, but it's just starting to kick in because it hasn't actually happened until just recently. As I scroll down, Here's a population change chart that shows kind of a nosedive from 1996 to 2007, um, just raw population in Allegheny County, but it's only gone from like 1.3 uh, million people down to 1.22, okay? So it's not, the chart is misleadingly steep, but I can imagine that prior to 1996, where my chart begins, there was a long history of steady decline in population, but then there you go, 2009, it ticks up again, and it starts to climb, and now it's looking like it's bobbling along <clears throat> a little bit above the low, but I can picture 20 years from now being able to see this as the low, and then population growth, because of the things that are you're saying are happening now, it just grows from there. Um, and of course, yeah, that's right. and one thing I, I, I would just want to say on population numbers, I don't know if you're pulling those from the census numbers, but if you think about it, I always thought the population numbers pulled from the census are very rear view mirror because you're looking at something that was produced in, I don't know, 2014, 15, 16, I don't know, but the actual census was done two years prior to that. So you're, yeah. you're, you're really kind of not getting a good picture of what's happening concurrently. Right, right. So that's, you're right, it is rear facing, but when you look at it, you know, you zoom out, you start to, knowing what's happening now, and seeing a little bit rear view mirror of what's happened before, there's just, it's just, it just screams, you know, bull market in real estate in, in Pittsburgh. Hopefully, it's not too crazy of a bull, because you like, one of the things that attracted you to it is it didn't have that much volatility. You'd like to see a couple of degrees of elevation every year, so that it winds up catching up to where it should be. Um, and one other chart that I've got here also that was one of my favorites is job diversity because consistently what you read in the headlines and what is actually happening are different. Um, they're just different. People, like people still throw around Rust Belt when they talk about Pittsburgh, right? And it's been a while since that Rust Belt label actually applied, but people are still throwing it around. It still has, it has an effect of... <sighs> repelling people who would compete with you, right? Like there's a silver lining in this, David, because you don't want all the big players to flood the market with supply and become investors. So let, let them think it's a rust belt, right? Because then, then they won't come in. They'll all compete with each other down in Dallas. This job diversity chart I'm looking at right now, this thing shows a user in a pie chart form the payrolls in that county broken up by, um, by category. And you would think that manufacturing was the driving economy or economic driver of Pittsburgh. And then when that went away, Pittsburgh is screwed. Right now, manufacturing is one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh down on the list. It is a sliver on the pie. The number one, which is 23%, is education and health services, right? Number two, professional and business services. Number three is trade and transportation utilities. Number four is leisure and hospitality, and number five is government. Now, so many places around this country, government is number one or number two, and healthcare is number one or number two. You've got education and health, which is number one, but then you've got all these other categories, in other words, you've got as diverse of a job package going on there before the manufacturing comes back, that as manufacturing comes roaring back and, and fights its way back to the top of the heap or the top three categories, None of those other ones are going to go away. They're not pushing them out. 
they kind of fill the void and then manufacturing is coming back. I, yeah, I think, I think that's exactly right. And what, what we've seen, you know, it's not an overnight story. It took 30 plus years to get there. And, you know, every five or 10 years, there was a new industry that slowly started to build. Um, you know, Pittsburgh is, I will say, it still has that blue collar mentality, uh, blue collar town. And people are very proud to have, you know, have a lot of pride in, in it and to be from it. And that, you know, translates into a lot of good things, uh, good things as well. Yeah, you know, one of the categories that we, you know, when you talk strategically, and I last week I talked about how I made an error, the investment I made in Charleston, South Carolina, where I got everything right for uh, the micro market I bought in, because while Charleston was killing it, the town that I bought in actually had a political problem, where there was a lot of forces in the town that did not want, you know, it was like a best kept secret that they wanted to keep secret. I banked on them wanting to let the secret out, and I miscalculated. What's been going on politically? Because just across the border in western New York, I grew up in New York, in southeastern New York, but I'm aware that western New York, uh, all of New York is controlled by the city politically, and they didn't want shale fracking. And so those cities on the western side of New York that would have maybe otherwise competed with you for at least the energy side of things, they have been doing you the biggest favor ever by basically locking it out. So what, has, what would you say about you know, long-term political will to bring business and, uh, and economic growth back to the city? Uh, I, I'd say the will is, is very strong. Um, you know, we love New York politicians, and we hope they keep uh, banning everything. So, uh, um, yeah, I agree with you. And, you know, everyone that comes there, that's the question they ask, well, what about the environmental, you know, aspect of it? Are people really going to want this here? Uh, what you have to realize is that Slightly before I, I grew up, uh, there was six inches of soot on the ground on top of cars and everything else. Um, this is a community that is used to, uh, you know, a, a dirtier environment. I mean, it seems pristine, clean now compared to what it used to be. People just care about jobs. And as you know, um, Western Pennsylvania, big swing state, a lot of the counties, um, you know, swung tremendously uh, that when I grew up, I never met a Republican. Um, didn't know one existed because it was blue collar Democrat union workers. And this last election cycle, Trump won the county by 20 points. One of the counties that we're operating in did less so in Allegheny County because it's more urban. But uh, having said that, people want jobs. That's all they want. They want jobs. They want opportunity. They've been kicked around for 30 years. Um, and now there's excitement in the air. So the political will is going to fo always follow the will of the people. Um, and the will of the people is for jobs and, you know, new industries and, and other things to take the place of the steel mills. Uh, because the steel mills, when they were, when they were cranking, pe people lived really well. Yeah. So that's a really interesting observation that the, you know, the, the not long ago, two major constituents of the Democratic Party were um, union blue collar workers and um, environmentalism and those two things became at odds over the last bunch of years because the job growth kind of needed to to set environmental concerns aside for a second to get the economy kicking again and uh, and some states went the other direction this is not a political statement it's just you know it is what it is here the deviation uh, of, the, of those two groups um, you know, the good news is, is that there's, you know, you talked about the soot on the car tops. That's not ever going to come back because there is still a very major sensitivity to making sure that you don't want to ruin the environment and the market. But it's like, let's create jobs and do it right. You know, like I have, I, I, my son and I are both car guys and I've got a 400 horsepower car that if I had one built in the 1960s, it would have been spewing more fumes into the air. But this thing is a highly efficient modern day. 400 horsepower engine and it's completely different on the emissions same thing happens everywhere you know those factories are being refitted with, um, with a whole different set of technologies to make sure they don't ruin the air uh, and as you mentioned before people are concerned about fracking ruining the soil or the water uh, and when that's absolutely proven cold maybe that'll change something but as of right now it hasn't been and they're but they're being pressured 
the industry, the energy industry is being pressured pretty hard to make sure that they figure out how to do this as cleanly as possible. So it's, it's actually a good story of the balance of both sides where the end result is progress is being made, where people are being taken care of, while at the same time the environment is also. Yeah, and, and just one more point on that. You know, the current governor of Pennsylvania is Tom Wolf, and he is a um, you know left of center guy, uh, and he ran on a platform of large increases in taxes for oil and gas drilling to fund education. Well, you know, here we are now um, in in this area in this era, uh, and he has been to this. I, it has to be five times over the last six months. He's been to this site, um, and he's embracing it. Um, you know, and uh, wants to attach his name to it, um, is proud that it's getting done and proud that it's providing jobs. So I, I think you're right. I mean, you know, bringing, you know, the plant's going to have 20,000, you know, generate up to 20,000 construction jobs um, over the next uh, next year, you know, six to 8,000 on site, and then there's all these knock-on effects. Um, so that's you know that's that, that's meaningful. There's a meaningful amount of uh, of people. Yeah, and if, and so you make a good point. The political will usually follows the will of the people. It's nice when that happens. And in this situation, everybody being able to fight for what's important, but not losing sight of the fact that at the end of the day, you've got a city here that is not coming back. It's back. Um, and now that the manufacturing is going to make its way back to prominence, it's going to be back in a very big way. And it looks like. You know the, the the heyday of Pittsburgh back in the last century is gonna is gonna pale in comparison to the heyday of Pittsburgh in the next century here. So uh, that's pretty exciting. Um, we got a couple minutes left. I wanted to throw two more things out and just get your opinion of them. One of them is on the tactical side. I had to share this only because I thought it was really cool. It's kind of out of place in the conversation, but um, the, does it, we started cluing into Pittsburgh back in maybe 2010 when Own America was really a training company where we were training real estate professionals around the country on how to represent their market as an asset class. So we taught real estate brokers how to be investment brokers, and we taught them how to look at this data and do the analytics, and it led to everything we're doing now. But I used to go and do a presentation, uh, you know, a, a training course for a day in front of two or 300 real estate agents. I had that in Pittsburgh. And I would, I would analyze their market as a knucklehead without knowing anything except for how to look at the data and ask them, ask them to fill in the blanks. And you can't see this, David, but I'll send it to you because it's really cool. There was a chart. I actually was there in 2012, and <clears throat> we did the home price performance chart, but instead of having an annual um, measurement where, where it was a nice smooth chart, we had it going monthly. And what you saw is a that's, that, that sort of slightly inclined straight line but when you meant, went monthly, you saw this crazy up and down zigzag. Like it almost looks like an EKG chart with a, a heartbeat, right? There was a high and a low and a high and a low. And the high was always right about in the spring. And the low was always six months opposite right about in the winter. And it swung, believe it or not, year after year after year, it swung. And it got to a point where since 2008, it was swinging 25%. The median sale price in Pittsburgh was 25% lower in December than it was in May, <laughs> right? It was bananas. And I would show this, I showed this chart to the audience and said, now what in the world do you think accounts for this? This, I've never seen this kind of seasonality that is so rock solid. And I want to ask you, what, if I showed you that, can you picture the image I just gave you verbally? I, I can, yes. Okay. What would you say, because I'll tell you, they made me laugh when I asked them, what, what do you think accounts for the, the wild swing in prices between winter and summer. It's, it's hard to go uh, house shopping when there's uh, three feet of snow on the ground. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the guy in the front row told me, it's cold as a witch's tit around here in December. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But he also said that everybody's yeah. watching football too. So between the, the cold and the football, nobody's buying houses. And But that was a reality of the market, that if you were going to do – Real estate sale, real estate investment in Pittsburgh loading up in the cold months was actually going to put you in an advantage because the home buying public was was watching the Steelers and staying out of the cold, and that and, and that was just something great to know, you know, something great to learn. Yeah. Do you see that still being the case? Uh, you know, it is. It's interesting you say that. We we do find steeper discounts on our purchases 
or feel like we have more negotiating power in the in the fall in the uh, fall and winter than we do in the spring and summer. Right, right, and so that's what the, the thing that I I always love about this is that I'm for some reason I'm I'm gifted with the idea of being able to see the data and sort of by asking a couple of questions learn things that. There's a lot of people in Pittsburgh that didn't know this. In fact, I was in a room, like I said, 250, 300 agents, and they're in the real estate business in Pittsburgh, and not a single one of them had ever known this. They knew it softened, but that's just seasonality, right? They didn't know it softened 25% off the peak. And so um, it was just it was a fun thing to discover, and I find this kind of stuff every single time I dig into a market to try to have the market's data tell me the story of what's happening there and then fill in the blanks with a, lo a local person who really is in depth. It's just incredible how often the story is so easy to kind of reveal, but until it's revealed, you know, you're among, I, mean, I swear to God, I was one of the first people that ever showed these people any kind of real tangible seasonality numbers. And it made me from a thousand miles away more knowledgeable about one important thing than even they were, and they were every day in the business down there. Right. So it's worth doing the homework. Right. <clears throat> All right, so one last thing I wanted to bring up is, um, and this is, again, off the subject, but this is a subject that I've been talking about here since, um, since December, uh, and that is that with the new advent of the SFR sector as a Wall Street-driven sector and with a new administration, again, you go back to geopolitics, you can see where the winds are going to blow. There was a, a mentality that said, um, in fact, let me pull up. Let me pull up what I said about it back then. They, I, I was privileged enough to have Housing Wire ask me what I thought was going to happen now that there was a new administration. What was going to happen in single-family rental, and you know, and HUD. And what I predicted back then in December was that FHA, HUD, and by extension Fannie and Freddie, they were going to become investor friendly. That they had been investor unfriendly for a lot of years, uh, a couple of decades, and um, because there are two different kinds of programs they offer. There are the single family home purchases that are really designed around home buyers and they kind of can be used by investors but not very well and you can't buy more than 10 houses or so and it, and it's not a good program. But over here, And the reason why they wouldn't allow it to be really attractive to investors is that sort of the charter of HUD and all of its derivatives is affordable housing. And they're damn well not going to let some investor make money because of anything they do. So it was, again, one of these political attitudes that kept them from being friendly towards investors. But over on this side of the house, they did have multifamily loan programs, right, where everybody who takes a multifamily loan is going to be an investor. I don't mean a two-family house that you live in one, but somebody who's got a 15-unit apartment building, they're getting a commercial loan. And FHA and Freddie, they had programs um, – not very well known, but they had programs for multifamily investors. So the whole argument about, um, well, we're not going to let investors make money because anything we do, we're here to help affordable housing. They already realized, and they were making it clear, they realized over here that multifamily investors that have lower costs of financing, some of that lower cost is going to translate into lower rents. And so it made sense to them to allow multifamily investors, but they still weren't allowing those loans to be applied to the single family multi-unit investor. And that was the, pro the projection that I made is they were gonna make multifamily lending products friendly to single family investors. Now it's seven months later, and this headline is Freddie Mac follows Fannie Mae to rental market with affordability as the goal. And I wanna ask you about it in a second, but I want everybody who's listening or watching to, to realize that's coming to pass. What you're seeing is something that made sense is happening, which is nice, right? something that, that nonsense was getting in the way of. And what you see here is Fannie Mae, a couple of months ago, did a billion-dollar loan guarantee for Invitation Homes, i.e. Blackstone. They got a lot of criticism because they were backing a Wall Street fund. Freddie Mac saw that, and they came out and talked about how they want this to be for the smaller investor, smaller firms that buy single-family homes and operate them um, and make an impact on affordable housing by offering lower cost financing to smaller landlords. Now they haven't defined small yet, but we're thinking it's going to be between five and a hundred units. That's what we're hoping because that would give lower cost financing to get like, how many do you have total at this point, Mike, uh, David, can you, uh, 
Can you share that with us? Yeah, we have uh, just over 100 at this point. Okay. So if somebody came along with a loan program that was backed by Freddie Mac, i.e. it was probably a, you know one or two points lower in terms of mortgage rate maybe, um, would that make an impact on you if you were able to refinance whatever loans you had for a lower rate? Um, it, it would and it wouldn't. Um, we, we do have some securitization loans which have steep yield maintenance penalties. Uh, so that would be difficult, but I will say uh, the hardest part of what we've done has been the financing market. It has been very difficult to get financing, um, large part because we have a GPLP structure um, and a lot of the local banks want personal guarantees, uh, and we just can't do it with, with, our, with our structure. Uh, so getting non-recourse financing um, is difficult if the agencies got involved. Uh, obviously, it would be a, it'd be a very big deal. Good. Well, that's what that's what we're hoping, and it's it's really gratifying to see this moving in that direction. Um, and uh, and what it means is that this this recognition by the powers that be that single family rental is not some little niche. You know, it's it's like a massive asset class. In fact, I've got this chart that I can just throw up on the screen also that I show sometimes that shows that. Where did it go? Hang on a second, it's too big for the screen. Let me just shrink it. Here's a chart that, again, you can't see, David, but I'll describe it. It just stacks up all the different real estate food groups, the commercial real estate food groups. So they've got multifamily, which is a $3.5 trillion asset class. So add up all the apartment buildings in the country, $3.5 trillion. Office, $2.2 trillion, so substantially lower. Retail, two point seven. so all the strip malls and shopping centers uh, and, and malls. And then industrial and hospitality are quite a bit smaller than that. But going back to multifamily is the biggest with 3.5 trillion. Single family rental is 3.1. And so this, this really was not known by many people until just a couple of years ago after this trend took hold where somebody finally said, let's measure the home, let's measure the residential single family market, not just through the lens of home ownership, but through the lens of rental. And holy moly, it's like the second biggest commercial asset class on the planet. Bravo for the federal agency in charge of housing to recognize the fact that there's a lot of good that can be done here. Um, and by, offer, by virtue of offering financing, it'll attract more people into it, thereby creating more housing stock. More housing stock for rent means rents are not going to rise as high. And so it ends up being a defeating thing for the industry a little bit where rents won't go as high, but their charter is affordable housing. So give low cost financing, create some more competition for rents, let more people live in more neighborhoods and school districts where they want to, but they can't afford to buy. And, you know, everybody wins. The for-profit side, the investors, we win because we get lower cost financing. The tenants win because they get more options. And the government agencies win because they are able to fulfill a part of their charter providing um, influencing lower, lower income families to have more affordable housing. So, David, anything um, you want to throw in before we go? Uh, that, that, that's about it. You know, I, I, I agree with you. And, you know, just dovetailing on that last, uh, last little piece that you said, um, there really is a, about 30-some percent of our portfolio naturally needs affordable housing goals um, just because of some of the price points and neighborhoods that we're working in. Um, and, uh, you know, what is uh, – What's pretty interesting is you're making a difference, you know, and, and part of this is a feel good thing. I mean, well, obviously, we're, first and foremost, we want to, we're, we're, you know, our goal is to make money and to make, make a lot of money for, for our investors. Um, but it's also a feel good thing uh, growing up there uh, and being a part of the resurgence and the comeback and improving the housing stock and, you know, seeing, um, you know, new people come in uh, from all over the world, really. Uh, to take advantage of some of these opportunities. Uh, it, it, it's really good, and, and I'm about as happy as I've been working, um, and I enjoy this way more than I did uh, at my time at Wall Street. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know what? It's the, the, the landlord's wearing a white hat now. You know, a landlord has been – I was talking to a reporter just before we started this today. It's the reason I was almost late. Um, and the reporter was struck with the idea that landlords, a lot of this policy and a lot of these – 
decisions have been made based upon this very shallow perception that landlords were somehow, um, I don't know, feeding off the population. You know, you picture the big black top hat and the bushy mustache in a black and white uh, film, you know. Well, meanwhile, you're in there fixing up houses in neighborhoods that need them, renting places out, giving people options they didn't otherwise have. And I think it's starting to move in the direction where we're now – when you've got government agencies willing to back landlords, it forces the question, you know, there are people being, there are people benefiting, there are families benefiting, there are kids who have dogs, who have backyards that would have been in apartments otherwise because of SFR owners. Uh, and it's about time that um, guys like us get some credit for being good people, right? Uh, I totally agree. Um, you know, there's always, always bad apples, um, but I would say the new entrants, and people that are trying to institutionalize this market um, are going to make the housing stock better. Uh, and, you know, at some point, probably it behooves everyone to come up with standard industry practices around this of what are best practices in the space. And, you know, as the, as the uh, market becomes more institutionalized, I'm, I'm sure we'll see that as well. And that's what this webinar is all about. So, David, Mike, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. Everybody who is watching, and listening, we appreciate you being here. Go have a great weekend. And when you're sitting there with your feet up on your front porch, dream big about what's possible in this sector because um, you've got a big wind at your back. So do what you can to catch as big of a wave as you can. Thank you. Have a great weekend. All right. Thanks, Gary. Take care.